Go thank ahead. you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about the effect of AI on jobs, on uh, uh, on the workforce, uh, on technology. But I want to think about uh, how AI will impact culture, the production of culture and art. Now, what do I mean by culture? I think of it very broadly as a meaning-making activity. Think of it in contrast to know-how. Know-how is technical knowledge, scientific knowledge, knowledge we use to transform the world. In contrast to that, humans have been engaged in a second type of activity, namely know-why, trying to figure out uh, the meaning of the world, what it all means, where we come from, where we are going. Um, and that know why is broadly what I think of as art and culture. Now suddenly, there seems to be a new agent uh, around the block, a new generator of art and culture, and that has profound impl implications on how we live in the world. And I want to think about what that means. So while on the one hand, humans, anonymous artists like the ones who decorated the Chauvet Cave 40,000 years ago, or more recent individual artists like Jane Austen, who created the famous first sentence of Pride and Prejudice, now we have a new kind of agent uh, in the world. What does that mean? In some ways, artists' culture has been waiting for this moment for about 200 years. Uh, artists have been imagining what it would mean for a new kind of agent to enter. Um, beginning with Mary Shelley uh, and her famous monster called The Creature, a tragedy of this new artificial intelligence. More recently, the Czech playwright Karl Čapek, who actually coined the term robot uh, in 1920, um, so, um, in some sense, aren't we prepared to now think about this new artificial agent? I'm going to suggest that that's actually the wrong way to think about it. Um, we are not dealing with a new artificial agent who exercises agency. We are actually think dealing with a tool. Now, when I say that AI should be understood as a tool, I actually don't mean to belittle its effects, because tools have profoundly transformative effects on us humans. Think of the tool of tools, the hammer. Since the Bronze Age, we've been hammering away. We've been using hammers to transform the world, right? That's what tools do. But in transforming the world, we have also transformed us. There's the famous saying that to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's usually meant as a critique, right? We shouldn't be focused just because we're holding a hammer, not everything is a nail. But there's actually this, I think, pro more profound truth behind that sentence, namely that we really do start to look at the world through this tool and are seeing nails. And thereby, we are actually transforming us. So we have been transforming ourselves into hammering humans, if you will. Now, in the debate whether AI is a new agent or just a tool, sometimes the term emergent properties has been used, right? because we can't quite anticipate how powerful AI is and how it really thinks and how it operates, that there will be emergent properties that we can't, its makers can't predict. And that may well be true, but I would argue that that's actually always true of all tools that because emergent properties emerge from the interaction of humans with tools. Now, I've just said to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but that's actually not quite true. It's maybe true for most humans, but if you give someone like Michelangelo a hammer and a chisel and a block of marble, he won't see a nail, he will see the statue of David. So that's actually a very different kind of proposition. There's kind of an emergent property here, um, and that means that uh, uh, that that uh, that doesn't. It's not, uh, I think, a good argument against the use of uh, AI as a tool. It's an emergent property that's also true of tool use. So, on the one hand, then I think it's overstating the case that there's a new alien intelligence agency that's acting on the world. No, it's a tool. 
On the other hand, we often hear the argument that AI is merely imitating art. That while we humans, out of the depth of our soul, are creating these original works, like the cave painters, like Jane Austen, AI is merely assimilating all these original works and then spitting, that out, spitting them out into our face. And, and I think that that's actually also the wrong way of putting it. It's part of the lawsuit against OpenAI uh, that, that has vacuumed up all these texts and uh, uh, full disclosure, some of my books are part of that data set too that's now suddenly unavailable because, it, because of that copyright dispute. But even though I have invested interest in them winning this case uh, 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 against OpenAI, I actually think it's the wrong argument to make. Why? Because in, in a profound way, all art is made from other art. That's something that I've recently argued in a book where I look at just vast examples of, of culture and, and it's very easy to see that art is made from, from other art. Uh, so the question is not, on the one hand, humans creating original works out of the depth of their soul and AI just using different artworks and mashing them up, because all of cultural history is basically a huge recycling project. So the question to ask is rather, how is art made from other art? And there, if you look at uh, uh, the way human artists are trained, and I was just talking with Hans Ulrich Ubrecht about this this morning, they go to art school where they are confronted with curated canons, very selective groups of artworks that they encounter in syllabi, in museums, in, 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 in school. Uh, and they are deliberately selective. Uh, and because they are selective, they are also highly contested. And if you contrast that with how AI is trained, it's trained with vast data, but that data is also selective, not so much in terms of quantity, and it's not deliberately selective the way curated canons are, but depending on the availability of data, and that goes back to the, uh, um, the, um, the copyright lawsuit, and the question of what kind of art works and art making even shows up in the training data. And so far, as we know, it's been very heavily dependent on text, images, and music. Very little, for example, on the performing art. And the last point I want to make about that, how AI can be used to generate art, you know, we've heard a lot of worries, and there's been a lot of worries about hallucinations, right, hallucinations. I love hallucinations. They're, they're so cool when it comes to AI and art creation. So I, I've been watching this question of hallucination. Of course, when it comes to factual information, it's, it's, it's problematic. But when it, as a tool for art making, I actually think hallucination is to be embraced rather than eliminated. So on the one hand, not an artificial agent like the robots uh, of RUR, and of course all the more recent HAL and so on and so forth. On the other hand, not just an imitation, but an interesting generation um, of art. Uh, but I want to come back to this question of the tool, that we wield it as a tool. And as in the case of the hammer, the question is how we use this tool. Now, if you open, and you all have done that, if you open most uh, uh, AI applications, you are confronted with what's usually called, in the case of OpenAI, a, a conversational interface. So I want to think a little bit about that, why and what it means that that's the way we interact with uh, generative AI through a conversational interface, because that's something very specific. And as with a hammer, I think that's the, that interaction between a human and that tool is going to be the key to how to understand and predict in some ways the effect this tool will have on how we transform the world, but also how we transform ourselves uh, along the way. Now, I emphasize that because I've long been very interested in conversation. If you look at the history of thought or human civilization, there was a really crucial moment um, in the ancient world um, that was dominated by one of some of the most foundational figures worldwide in, in thought. And those through Buddha, 
Confucius and Socrates are the, the, the key figures here. Now, there's something very specific they have in common, and that's that they didn't write treatises, they didn't write philosophical treatises or deep dive lectures, they engaged in conversation. They each developed specific techniques of conversation and argumentation that shaped their thought, and in some sense, you could say, initiated the history of both Western philosophy, in the case of Socrates, Chinese philosophy, and South Asian philosophy, in, in the case of Confucius, and South Asian philosophy, in the case of Buddha. Now, they developed this in conversation, rather than in writing treatises, and in fact, they, none of them wrote a single work, even though they lived in literate cultures. They engaged, they perfected this art of conversation, of a conversational interface, if you will, and then their students, often many generations later, wrote down these conversations as philosophical dialogues uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and similar kinds of forms of writing. So conversations, as in this great, uh, wonderful image by David of Socrates con in, in conversation with his friends. So what does the conversational interface of JGPT look like from that lens. Well, you might say, well, that, you know, that's very different. These are real people having a conversation, as, as, as in this image, uh, whereas you're just interacting with this AI model. But I think that's a false alternative, again, because there's actually no reason to believe that Socrates ever had these conversations with real people or the Buddha and Socrates, for that matter, in the kinds of conversations that are part of their foundational texts, the Confucian Analects and the, and the Buddhist Sutras. These conversations, these forms of dialogues, were devices, artificial devices, in a way, that these schools of philosophy developed. And if some of you remember reading Socratic dialogues, you'll remember that they often seem very artificial, like, you know, at the end, yes, Socrates, no, Socrates, perhaps Socrates. So these, these are not authentic conversations between people, but techniques of argumentation, uh, uh, te techniques of thought. And so this is, I think, perhaps how we can now understand or begin to understand, begin to think about how we interact with AI in, as a kind of new type of conversation that is emerging that is to some extent like these equally artificial uh, 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 philosophical dialogues, but that will have other features. Uh, but it, it is this kind of interaction that happens. So, so there's, in some sense, what we're seeing the emergence of is a new type of philosophical dialogue that has going to be particular rules and, and skills, writing prompts, follow-up prompts, trying to understand what AI understands, correcting uh, in these kind of cascades of prompts and responses. And what's particularly interesting to me that this is even true for image generation, right? So in some sense, the fact that we generate images through these cascades of dialogues really puts words really at the center stage. I know there are, there are the forms of input, drawings and so on and so forth, images generating other images, but so far at least, there's a, an unusual verbal uh, interaction that's at the center of this, or, or that's quite crucial. Uh, and to generate these images, uh, you have to be a skilled prompt writer. So this is, this is uh, uh, then the, what it means to think of this particular kind of tool, it's not a new robot, uh, doesn't just imitate art, but it's a particular kind of tool that will transform us as we are assimilating to its abilities, the way we, over the centuries and millennia, uh, assimilated to the hammer. And so if some of you are interested in exploring this a little further, um, uh, just after this event, I'll do a workshop, uh, a workshop specifically about writing and how AI will transform writing as part of a, a project that I'm pursuing at Harvard uh, with some colleagues to create a new online writing course that is both 
integrating AI and emphasizing the kinds of skills that I, writing skills that our AI is not good at. Uh, and so we are trying to think about to what extent to preserve the aspect of writing that's crucial for critical thinking, that we need students, even in the age of AI, to go through and learn in order to be critical thinkers. Uh, and on the other hand, how, how to figure out which aspects of writing and critical thinking AI can do, how we can use that tool in the realm of writing. Thank you very much.